two guys of Minnesota sports flowing in their veins. Mackie and Judd on Score North and scorenorth.com. And it's time for Talking Twins. Zolgad, Jake Depew, who will join us each Monday for uh, Talking Twins. Declan Goff producing and chiming in as always. And uh, Jake, where would you like to start off of a, a, a season that began with an unsuccessful game due largely to Alex Colome on Thursday, but then the Twins come back and get a masterpiece from Barrios on Saturday and a very good effort from Michael Pineda on Sunday and start the season 2-1 and one against the Brewers. Where would you like to begin this episode of Talking Twins? Man, there's a lot to get to. That was mm-hmm. a uh, that was a dramatic series, um, especially for the first series of the year. Why don't we start with Donaldson? Uh, I hate to go negative at the start, but I think I think we have to talk about it. So, all right. So here's what concerns me. Here's what concerns. I'm, I'm just going to give you flat out, and this is not an opinion. This this is off of what Josh said. He did a Zoom call with the media on Saturday. Okay. Mm-hmm. Here's what worries me. So. And I think we talked about this, Jake. Going back to, it might have been the start of spring training. Josh, who's pretty frank about things, like he doesn't try and cover stuff up or lie. He mm-hmm. said, to help my calves, which have been chronically bad, uh, what, two of the last three years going into this year. He said, I have altered the style in which I run. Now, he didn't really, I don't think, elaborate on that. But he did say, and I said to myself, oh boy, I've heard this before. From guys, and it's really not a good thing because, like, if you if you take the pressure off your calves, it's going to put pressure somewhere else potentially. Now, on Saturday, and he said this, and then tried to downplay it, but to me, it's a red flag. He talked about the fact that in altering how he runs the bases, that he is going to be applying essentially more pressure on his hamstrings to get pressure off his calves, mm-hmm. which in a perfect world sounds great. Because then, you know, oh, goody, the calves won't be a problem. Long story short, though, you do have to be curious if the hamstring problem, and keep in mind he's 35, too, he's no kid, that the hamstring problem that reared its ugly head in his second at bat of the season and the top of the first of the opener is basically subject to he's now going to put more pressure on his hamstrings and he got, got hurt. Um, he was put on the 10-day IL because in the Twins world, it's just precautionary. I don't think we're going to see him again till May, though. And and what really concerns me is I don't know that altering how you run and putting the pressure elsewhere at this point in his life is going to work on any type of full-time basis. Floor is yours. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, and you tweeted this, but what we're seeing here is a, a 35-year-old man uh, with chronic you know, leg issues, who's having another leg issue. And like, yes, it's not the calf. And I guess that's good. But obviously the the hamstring and the calf are related. Um, and he's and he's changed his running style and putting more pressure on the hamstrings. I mean, it, it sucks. It sucks for everyone involved. You know, I mean, it, it's not it's not for lack of effort that he's not out there. But um, it's just I guess to me, it's hard to see them coming up with a solution where he can play 120, 130 games in a year. Like this kind of feels like Ken Griffey Jr. at the end of his career to me, you know, where he constantly was dealing with hamstring issues and pulling, you know, pulling various muscles. Um, so I hope I'm wrong about that because I love watching Donaldson play. He's a great player when he's out there. But I mean, the f- <laughs> he injured himself in the first at bat of the year. I mean, it's just it's just not a good situation. And and you know, this is total um second guessing because I was all about the Donaldson signing when they did. I thought it was a great signing. I was, I was pumped up. The twins finally Mm -hmm. did something right. They finally made a big splash. And this is the risk of, you know, signing big deals to, to, to older players. Um, It's a risk and I'm glad they took the risk, but right now it's, it's looking like it's not working out. There's still a lot of time left in this contract. Hopefully he can figure it out, but we're, you know, we're going to be on pins and needles every time he comes to the plate and every time he's running the bases from here, you know, through the rest of his twins career, I think. So not good. What's the answer here? Cause I'll start. I'll, I'll start when he comes back, drills the ball off the wall in right field. It's let's say the top of the third or something or, or third or fourth. Mm-hmm. I think you got to tell him to stop. Like, I don't think it's worth the double. And, and I think late in games, you you have to pinch run. 
because Jake, there's no answer here. Like, like there's no magical elixir now. There's nothing. Like, if you want to keep him playing as long as possible, and and I think that we're both right in saying this certainly appears to be a chronic problem now. Um, I think you have to sit him down, and I know he's competitive as hell. Okay, so this is going to be very difficult. But I think you need to sit him down and say, Josh, I'm about to show you all of the, the potential extra base hits of David Ortiz in like his last two or three years. They're all singles. They're all singles. Like what, I mean, what else? Because if there is no way that him getting a double against the Brewers in the top of the first on Thursday was worth it. Just stop. Yep. But here's the thing, Judd. David Ortiz is a DH. They don't have the H at bats to give to Josh Donaldson. So they can maybe do that next year and the year after. Um, but he's going to have to play the field. And that's really where more of those quick explosive type of yeah, moves happen uh, than, than running the bases. And the other thing is, if you have him stop every time he hits a double, then he turns into a singles hitter. And that's not really that valuable. Like he, he provides value from his defense and from his power. And if you take both of those things away because of the injury issues and he's just a singles hitter who doesn't, you know, have the range that he used to have, then he's not that valuable a player. So I, I, there is no answer there, uh, other than... <laughs> I other was trying than, to help, but you are right about, about what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, I just, I, I do think that there's hope for him as a DH because he can still really hit, obviously. Um, and, and that was clear just from that one that one batted ball. I mean, he absolutely crushed that ball into the gap. Um, so I think there is hope for that down the road. And if Cruz needs, you know, a day off or gets hurt, they can plug Donaldson in. But I just, man, I, I, I don't see how he can play... 130 games in the field. Like I, I really hope I'm wrong, but it just it's not trending You're in that direction. Right. It's not trending in that direction. Yeah. All right, player two, Byron Buxton. Now he supposedly <sighs> is just sick. Okay, until until I know more, I'm not buying a thing. Like I just don't know. Yeah. Um, but those first two games, like in, in fact, I, I wrote down Jake in my notes. This is who we've been waiting for, right? Like the confidence, the strength, the complete package. Like this is what we have been waiting for. No leg kick. Um, a, a definite confidence in what he can bring at the plate. And he's on deck yesterday and leaves. Um, I, I guess if I had a, a magic wand and I could wave it above Donaldson's head or Buxton's head and like for one year, health, okay? But I could only do it for one I'm doing it for Buxton because my curio my curiosity is so damn high about let's say this guy can play 150 games center field healthy no problems um because it just it appears that what he's doing from a standpoint of when when he can play is so now on the right track but it's just so maddening and I don't know it I'm not blaming him but it's just so maddening when, you know, it's what, the third uh, um, on Sunday? And Byron Buxton's going to be pinch hit for now because just drives you crazy because there is so much potentially there. Yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna be the optimist on this one. I'm going to be take a cue from you last week. Uh, you predicted 96 wins, optimistic, Judd. I actually think, I think this is more of a fluke. Um, once once it was determined, because I, I, I was convinced, well, not convinced, you can never be convinced of these things, but I was suspecting that it could be COVID because they pulled him from the on deck circle. And that would suggest that it could be COVID. And so the fact that it's not COVID is a good thing. Um, so, I mean, like he's obviously had a history of these fluky types of things, but, but let's, uh, I'm willing to still wait and see on Buxton. Um, I'm much more pessimistic on Donaldson, but I, I think if, if this is just a stomach bug and he's back in a sure. day or two, and again, of course, like we don't know because the twins, you know, aren't always totally forthcoming about these things. Um, but what he did in that first series before he went out was unbelievable. I mean, this is the MVP level Buxton that we talk about. I mean, when he plays, he's an MVP candidate, period, like full stop, in my opinion. Like that, like he's unbelievable. He hits for power, he runs down everything in the gap, he steals bases. Like he's he's incredible. I mean, he even hit a double in in that game before he went out. So um I, I actually think I'm not super concerned right now. If it was, I'm not either. An, yet. If it was an ankle injury or a yeah. wrist thing, I'd be much more concerned, but it sounds like he maybe just has a stomach bug uh, and he doesn't have COVID. So I'll take that for now. But yeah, of course, obviously with his history, it's not an ideal way to start the season. Exactly. Right. Can I give uh, you my, can I give you yeah. one theory real quick related to Buxton? So of course, Ken, 
So Rocco had that challenge, right? In the, well, whatever inning Buxton was pulled. Third inning, Sunday. Mm-hmm. Third inning, yep. Where he challenged the, that Arise play and it was a, a terrible challenge and everybody was like, it's, it's not even close. And then Polanco later stole the bag and was called out and they didn't have a challenge to, to overrule it. I yes. think he might've been challenging there, waiting to see if Buxton could finish up whatever he was, was going to throw up. <laughs> yeah, seriously, though, because he was on <laughs> Dude, deck. You're going to puke, puke now. He, he was on deck. He was yeah. on deck. And I just wonder, I've, just total reckless speculation, speculation, right? Very on brand. Um, but I wonder if he was like, let's buy ourselves another two or three minutes and see if, if Bucks and King can get back. Maybe there. That because challenge, that was such a bad well, challenge. And there's no one, there's no one on God's green earth that told him to challenge that. Right. Like right. it wasn't, it wasn't close. Right. And it's, a so you're the, right. It's not a critical play in the game. Like there's no real reason that he would challenge there. Like I, I can't imagine Rocco's not that bad at challenging. Like he doesn't have a history right. of being terrible at challenges. So um, he's not Mike Tice, you know, to, I saw you tweeting about Tice, but I always love that about Tice. No, My that favorite. was Roycey, Ticey. Oh, it was Coach, Ro- Coach Flaggy, he called him because he threw the flag so much to challenge. My that favorite, was Patrick. My favorite Tice moment ever is one time he threw the flag and uh, and they announced that the, the call had gone against the Vikings, but Tice thought it had gone for the Vikings and he pumped his fist and he was so excited. His pencil was falling out of his ear. And then all of a sudden you saw the realization on his face like, oh, crap. We oh yeah, yeah. Z- Zim and Tice have the same <laughs> challenge problem. They challenge when they're mad. Right. It's like never. Don't drive mad. Don't challenge mad. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Baldelli. That that was a weird one because that one had no chance. And and then of course it came back that basically right after that was the Polanco steal on which he was called out, which was a terrible call, and the challenge was gone by then. Uh, Luis Arise, okay? Mm-hmm. Lead off uh, was outstanding. Six for 12 with three walks in the three games. Uh, what do you do when, when Josh does come back? Do you play him in left field almost every day until Kirilov comes up? Because, I mean, I mean, if he can do this offensively from that spot, he's not... I, I don't care where he plays. He can play left. He can play third. He can play second. But he needs to play. Like, th- this will be a guy who, at least from his start, is going to need to be in on a daily basis. And the thing I see, this looks like him again, 2019. So, like, 2020, he got a little bit chubbier. He was hurt for sure. This guy now th- that we've seen to start looks like the same guy as far as contact goes, as far as confidence goes. And and I don't I don't see a path here towards you know him being out of out of uh, the um, for, for the twins two or three times a week if he's playing like this. Right, except I, I hope he didn't just get hurt. We're recording this in the middle of the Tigers game. The trainer just came out like 10 minutes ago uh, and it looked like he might have had a pectoral issue. Um, so hopefully he's not hurt. Assuming he's not. Um, he has to he has to be in the lineup basically every day. I, I love her. He's my favorite guy to watch hit on this team. I, I think a lot of people would probably say that um, the at bats that he takes, you know, when he got called up in 2019, like you were referencing, he was like a 10 yep. year vet, you know, yep. like the, the pitches that he takes. I'll never forget the at bat he had against Edwin Diaz, where he's down, mm-hmm. came off the bench and there was down 0-2 in the count and worked. Yeah, pinch hit. Yeah. Yeah. Because scope got hurt. Um but yeah, I, I think you just find a position for a rise, whether, like you said, it's left field, second base, third base, whatever. He needs to play five to six times a week. I mean, I, I, you know, he, he'll he be in contention to win a batting title this year, I, I think, and and for many years down the road. So, like, he, the issue with a rise, though, and I love a rise, but he has to hit. And he has to hit, like, over 300 because he doesn't have speed. He's right. a he's a average defender. So if he doesn't hit for a, a really high average, he's not super valuable. But right now he is, and he's drawing tons of walks. Um, and he's being that spark plug. He's he's kind of a, a other than the speed. He's a prototypical leadoff hitter. You know, he he works long at bats. He gets on base. He yep. he he lets everybody else see all the pitchers' pitches in the first inning. Um, so man, what? Yeah, he's a super valuable piece. Hopefully, he's okay. But uh, he's got to play. I mean, he has to play. Even three when guys up. hurt already. Oh my god, it's brutal. Good God. I mean, it's it's game four. I know, I know, and yet they're two and one, and currently up six zero uh, on the Tigers. So yeah, well, the Tigers suck at baseball. So <laughs> well, uh, go ahead, Bur- Burrios. Saturday night. First of all, let me say this: as a baseball fan, 
That pitching duel was art. That was fantastic. That was so much fun. Um, now, now we've seen him pitch like this before. Barrios has had great starts. Okay, I'm not. I'm not going to get officially excited about him until I see him get through an August where he pitches well. And I'm serious about that because there's always that one month. That being said, though, if if again this goes back to everybody slots in correctly, Maeda is is your ace. And I don't know, he, he's not a true ace type, but he's a good pitcher. He's really good. Barrios then has the pressure off of him. Pineda, Sunday, looked absolutely fantastic. If everybody slots in right here, this rotation, at least the, the front end of the rotation, Jake, is going to be damn good. And with Barrios going toe-to-toe and striking out 12, that was a great sign. I mean, that might have been the best start of his career. Uh, it was right up there with his opening day start in 2019, where he was where he outdueled uh, Kluber on opening day. Um, but man, yeah, I mean, he had everything working. Obviously, it, I, I was disappointed. He shouldn't have. Got, there's no way he could have gotten the no hitter. I, I thought they should have sent him out for the seventh. I get the logic. It's, I'm with it's, you. It's the second game of the year, but he was only at 84 pitches, and I just think. They've pulled him so many times now, yes. including in the biggest spots, you know, in the playoffs. I think at some point you, you need to say, Jose, you're our guy. You are absolutely filthy right now. We're going to leave you in. We trust you to get through the seventh inning. Um, and, you know, if he lets on a couple base runners, then you take him out. But, like, yep. yeah, I was disappointed in that. But, yeah, that's that start was incredible, man. That, that was one of the best baseball games I've seen in a long time. And I, I tweeted this, but after a super long, mostly really crappy offseason – um, where a bunch of just terrible things happened, um, you know, in, in the world, um, to 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 watch that and remember why you love baseball so much, like that, it, it was just great to see. That was a great, great game. Absolutely, and and it was for baseball in 2021, really quick. Mm-hmm. Like th- Thursday was four hours plus, and it was long. not a and it was not a good game no. like it was not a good game it was it was a lot of it took too much time pitchers couldn't find their spot and that game you're right is exactly why baseball's great now now on Baldelli pulling Barrios after eight, 84 pitches in uh, 6 mm-hmm. so here's my problem and I like Rocco, okay? Like, Rocco's done a good job. This yeah. whole, the whole Twins administration has done a really good job. The playoffs are maddening, but they've been to them. They've won back-to-back division titles. So there's a lot to like here, okay? So this is not a, a these guys should be fired. None of that. Uh, just to be clear. But I wanted Rocco to leave Brios in for the seventh. More so I could see it from Rocco then is Brios going to uh, fall, fall apart the third time through uh, when he faces the Brewers again? I wasn't worried. Brios was pitching so well, and until it's erased from my mind, that he, those two games in the playoffs against the Astros, Jake, are going to stick with me. And there was no excuse for pulling the two starters in those games in that importance when they did. And I texted you about this, but to me— Saturday presented an opportunity, and I want to be very clear about this. I am not saying for Brios to pitch nine, okay? So I'm not saying that. I'm not saying you don't take him out until he gives up a hit. But what it did was it presented an opportunity for me, for Rocco to show in-game growth about the about the actual game itself and where it's going and the people playing it. And if this had been your fifth starter, if this was like Dobnik or something, right? Take him out whenever. I I honestly don't care. I really don't care. But Barrios is so important. And empowering him to me is so important. And what you did against the Astros was so inexcusable that that to give him, to allow him to at least get to take your pick, 96 pitches Saturday was not going to kill him. And it would have sent a message. Because what I still don't know is when it comes to individual games and the and the potential bio rhythms of the game itself, does Rocco get it? I think Rocco's really smart, and I think Rocco does a really good job, and I think he prides himself on knowing people. But I don't know that his in-game management of people is always the best. And this was a case where 
There was nothing Barrios was doing that should have scared you into saying he has to be done now. After seven, I'm fine with it. But the difference between six and seven to me from what it would have signified from Baldelli was pretty important, and he still pulled the plug. Yeah, it's weird because I really like Rocco too. I think he's a good a really good manager and he's a great as you've said regular season manager and over 162 games he can manage personalities really really well he has a super high emotional IQ I think um mm-hmm. and that's why it's so weird to me like I think in his mind the message he's sending is we don't want you, we we believe in you and we don't want you to get hurt you know we and that's load management right that we care about you so much that we don't want to push you but I yep. think it, it, for a lot of athletes, the message that they're that they're getting when they get pulled like that is you don't trust me. You know, you don't trust me in these big spots. Um, and, and and I wouldn't blame Barrios for thinking that because they'd never push him, you know, that they, they never seem to trust him. Um, and and so, it, yeah, it's weird to me, too. Again, like even if it's just for like one batter, you know, or, or just until a base runner gets on just to just to send the message, as you said, that like you're our guy. We trust you. We, you're a workhorse. You're, you're absolutely dealing right now. Go out there and be a bulldog and, you know, finish the seventh inning, but they're just never going to do that. You know, the fact that they, they didn't do it in the playoffs in 2019, they definitely didn't do it in 2020. It just tells me that they're always just going to go by the books. And here's my question. Here's my question. Yeah. It, uh, do you think these are even Rocco's decisions or do you think that this is, you know, the front office basically saying when he gets to X pitches, you know, you pull him no matter what. I think they're all in cahoots probably, but I do think it's Baldelli's decision to say when. Um, yeah. I think it was Rocco on Saturday. The playoffs I'm not sure about because I don't know what, what those discussions are. But it just, but I mean, I, I honestly don't care who. Like if it's Derek and Thad, Rocco, if it's Rocco, if it's um, Derek, Rocco, I don't care who. I care about the why, and I care about the fact that I'm with you completely, which is the message to Barrios has to be, we trust you more than Dobnik. We trust you. You need to treat your star players differently, Jake. And and again, that doesn't mean dumb, and it does not mean that, you know, what the hell, let's go up to 125, his pitch count. No, I'm not, I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is Rocco Baldelli played a huge role in losing that at least the second game, if not the first game, but the second game to the Astros in the playoffs. Like that's his, that's as much his loss. He went out and got a guy who was throwing great and pulled him. Why? Like why? That's a star player. Look, there is no question in my mind, and I don't know if you agree with this assessment or not. There's no question in my mind that if Barrios gets to the end of his contract and doesn't sign here or, or is in talks with teams, that his camp is going to come back to look at what they did when I was pitching well at times. And it might not be fair, but guess what? He's a competitor, right? He's a competitor. And I don't think anybody is advocating being stupid. The Santana, Terry Collins, uh, you know, let, let's have, have you throw what? 134 just because, you know, it's possible to get the no, no, no. No, that's dumb. I understand that. But if you are Barrios and you're a competitor and you're wound like he is, you have to look at these things too and say, I give you the best chance to win. Did you give me the best chance? And there is no doubt that if you go back to game two of the playoffs, the answer is the Twins did not do that. So so that's why on an April night, you pulled him. It's fine. It's no big deal. But it's a big deal for me because it shows no growth from you as far as the management side and how the team approaches player side. And Jose Barrios right now deserves more than that. It's a very convoluted thing because I'm not really obsessed with that one game. I am obsessed with what you've learned because look, there is no, you have lost five consecutive playoff games and from the top down, Jake, you haven't given yourself the best chance to win. Like, you're not giving your players the best chance. And they're failing, too. I'm not absolving them. But you are also not giving your players the best chance. And at some point in time, that corner has to be turned or you will continue to fail. Yeah, well, I mean, we've talked about this at length, but there's no question that some of the playoff games were really badly mismanaged. You know, whether it was in 19 
um, having Stashek out there in a close game and him and, and then pitching Stashek multiple innings in 2020 uh, when, you know, Whistler and Clipper didn't even make an appearance in the series. Like there are a lot of things that you can point to in terms of mismanagement there. But I think Barrios was at the top of the list last year. Um, and even in 2019, I'd have to look at what his pitch count was, but he was pitching well in that game one. He got really unlucky when CJ Crone dropped that double play ball, uh, but he was pitching well and, and they pulled him early, you know, and, and brought in Stashak and, and others and Kyle Gibson. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. So, but you know, to me, it's like, it, it's really frustrating and disappointing um, because I, I agree with you. I, I, and I think it probably does piss Burrios off. And I also think it might, you know, piss him off in the sense of it lowers his value when it comes to arbitration, you know, if he's yeah. pitching fewer innings. Um, <laughs> but it's just, it's clear at this point, like the sample size is large enough that they're just not going to change you know this is just who they are but this how can smart philosophy. people not change well but like yeah. they're smart they're smart but they've they're very smart but but we haven't seen any evidence like <laughs> has know. there been the only evidence we've seen that they're willing to change is the emphasis on defense this year that is one area where i think they realize okay True. this cost us a lot in 2019 in particular um and they went out and signed andrelton simmons you know so but but yeah in terms of their philosophy on pulling pitchers and pitch counts and all of that uh, I, I don't see any improvement or, you know, however you want to frame it, it's just any change in their behavior. I don't know, Dex, I don't know if you want to chime in, but I, I just, this is who they are. They're just, this is who they are. <laughs> it It is, but I just, I don't, I don't get how smart people don't adapt slightly at least. Yeah, I don't know. Sometimes I feel like, you know, baseball, and I'm, I'm a big analytics guy too. I like blending it, but you also have to blend that field test into it as well, right? And you have to surround yourself with guys who are also able to judge those situations and not just completely look at the numbers and look at the nerd part of the game. Like you have to, that's when analytics work best is when you can use both the eye test and the numbers to, to, to make your point, not just going all in on the data where I feel like Baldelli has gone all in on data driven people. And yes, in general, the Twins have turned things around very quickly. I credit Falvey and Levine. I think they're very good executives. And I think Rocco Baldelli is still a good manager. It's not like I'm ready to bail on him by any means. But I do think, especially the, in the two postseasons that we've seen, it's been insanely frustrating watching him manage the pitching staff. But what's really weird about that is is he does a really good job during the course of the season with people. Like, he's good with people. Yeah, like he gets, he gets it. He doesn't yell and scream. He He... Delegates, I think, to guys like Cruz really well. So it's not like he's this obtuse, uh, you know, not people person um, who doesn't get it. He, it, I mean, he gets people. He manages them really well. He works his butt off to try and, I think, um, you know, treat guys differently who need it. A guy might need a kick in the butt. A guy might need um, a scolding, something like that. And... This is the one where I don't understand it because it's like if it was just all stats and like he was this cold as ice guy, I would sort of get that. But I wouldn't think he's as smart as I know he is. And that's what's weird to me. It's like this is the step of, okay, Jose Barrios, a really good pitcher. He's pitching outstanding. He's got 12 strikeouts, 84 pitches, going toe-to-toe. And you're like, ah, that's uh, that's it. It's like at some point in time he draws this w- these weird lines and but I don't that, get them. But that's why I think maybe he's not the one drawing them. You know, maybe you're I, right. I, I mean, if he has orders to pull Barrios after 80 plus pitches, you, you no matter right. what, then yeah. you know, uh, I, yeah. It's but the, we'll never know, right? They're never going to reveal that. Uh, bullpen, Jake DePew. Mm-hmm. Uh, it it uh, or I, I shouldn't say it. Column A on opening day melted down completely. But in the last two games yes. of the Brewer series, seven innings, two hits, one run, two walks, ten strikeouts, and in eleven and two thirds in the three games, fourteen strikeouts. The bullpen looked damn good. Colome didn't on th- Thursday, but for the most part, and I think it was Stashik who gave up the home run to Jackie Bradley Jr. on Sunday. But then he uh, essentially settled down after that. Bullpen looked really strong in those first three games. Yeah, they did. And Hansel, uh, Ro- is it Robles or Robles? Ro- Robles. Robles, thank you. Um, he was throwing like 98, and he was yeah, not throwing could. that hard in spring training. Uh, Duffy, we were worried about his velo. He was throwing 95. Um, Taylor Rogers, we were we were talking last week about 2019 or 2020 Taylor Rogers. Bingo. Man, he looked so good. I know it's only one inning, 
Uh, but he came in after, you know, they pulled Barrios and completely, I think he struck up the side, uh, throwing 96, that breaking ball looked nasty. Like, um, so, you know, this is one area that I was really concerned about and where the sample size is too small to say either way, but the early returns have been really encouraging. Colome came back and had a good outing, uh, on Saturday. Mm-hmm. The, the meltdown was bad. I mean, the, the not throwing to first and taking the out was just inexcusable. Any high school player knows to make that play, but <laughs> Other than that, other than that huge meltdown, which unfortunately came in the first game of the season, you're right. I mean, there's nothing to to complain about with the bullpen so far. Um, they've looked phenomenal, and Matt Shoemaker right now, uh, I know it's a t- you know he's facing the Tigers, but he looks good. He's a total wild card. He's kind of like Rich Hill last year because when he he's pitches, hurt a lot, right? When he pitches, he's, he's really ton, yeah. good, but he's yeah. hurt a ton. Yeah. So if they can get if they can get 15 starts out of him, that Dobnik, that right? Mm-hmm. Then you plug in Dobnik. like he comes in and yep. starts. Yep. Exactly. Um, yeah, the the thing on T- Taylor that impresses me is I really do think that the totality, and I, I think we talked about this last week as well, the totality of what happened in 2020, player rep assignment, 60-game season, I think that that threw some guys off, and and he was a guy who I think got th- thrown off, but mm-hmm. he, looks, he looks like his stuff is definitely back. And if his stuff is definitely back, I think by the middle of this month or early May, it'll probably go back to to him closing games more. Which, by the way, there are closers. I mean, as much as Rocco wants to say that there, there's definitely he definitely has an order of when guys pitch in mind. But um, if he bounces back, it's a huge, huge uh, help because he he looked off. I thought for basically, and he was not terrible, but. All of last year seemed like he was trying to push through it, and he looks comfortable now again. And if he is truly back, it's an enormous help. Yeah, and I, I, I'm getting closer and closer to just saying we should throw 2020 out the window completely. I think you're right. Yeah, well, it was... yeah, I think for him, you, you know, one I think might be too, might be. I'm not there yet completely. Garver. Yes, Garver. Yes. I'm. Garver went on, and we, we talked about this last year, Jake. But I'll never forget Garver, who again I think is a really sort of cerebral, smart guy. Mm-hmm. He went on he went on a Zoom last summer. I think it was during the training camp, and he basically admitted, "I don't want to be here, but mm-hmm. for but for service time purposes, I have to be." And he wasn't it wasn't a woe is me, like he was just saying this is really difficult, and this is and I don't know what was going on outside um, baseball for him. But it was almost like he was saying, I'm here because I have to be, but this ain't fun. And he was awful. And he got hurt. Uh, but I think that there are certain guys where you are a thousand percent correct. I think that there's certain guys, Rogers, Garver, who you have to take the 60 game uh 2020 and just say, forget about it completely. It doesn't mean that they're great players, but it definitely means that their minds are more free now. And I think probably the more observant and smarter that you are, the more difficult that whole thing was to just tune out what what was what had to be a trying year. Well, yeah, because it's pretty easy to look around and say, what the bleep are we doing here? You know, yeah. we're playing in front of no fans in the middle of a raging pandemic. We're isolated to our hotel rooms constantly. All these teams are getting shut down. Like, yeah, I mean, baseball is so mental to begin with that if you have all of that stuff in your head, and again, who knows what's happening, you know, with all these guys' families or whatever. Um, it, it, I, I just, there are a lot of reasons that you can come up with for why guys might've had off years. And, and Garver was, like you said, was also hurt. You know, I mean, he missed a lot of the year and yeah. um, obliques are, it was an oblique, I believe. And obliques are it was, uh, serious yeah. things. Yeah. So um, if he gets back to anything close, even 80% of what he was in 2019, that's a super valuable uh, player g- given the position he plays. Three games in, I've got a question for you, Jake DePew. So, right. so if, if, if Buxton can play, I think he could be great. Or no, I don't think. I know he can be great, okay? A guy like Garver, uh, as we just talked about, for sure can bounce back. And I don't know he's great, but he's certainly a solid player if he's playing well. Several years into his career, as we start the 2021 season, what's the realistic expectation that, not what we used to have, but what's the realistic expectation for Miguel Sano? Like, what do you think? But I mean, like, like, let's just settle on what we think he should do, not what we wish he could do. 
Because, I mean, I think he's here for a while. I don't think that they're going to trade him. So, like, what, as a person who tunes into a bunch of Twins games, what do you think the realistic expectation in your mind should be for a guy who we once thought could be fantastic? Yeah, I mean, I think we need to lower expectations significantly from what we once thought he could be. Um, I, I think a realistic expectation is he plays decent defense. And I will say he's better defensively at first than I thought he would be. Um, it, it slug, you know, ha, slugs around 500 with a bunch of home runs and leads the league in strikeouts, you know, or, or is right up there. Uh, his strikeout rate is just enormous um and as long as he st strikes out and checks swings and does all that stuff as much as he does uh he's just never gonna you know fulfill his his potential at the plate so i, I mean i think he's he's basically uh an adam dunn type you know and unfortunately i think you're right yeah and that guy can win you some games you know yep. i mean he can win you games with home run i mean he, he had a, a a meaningful home run yesterday uh but i don't think he's ever going to be the complete hitter that we saw when he was a rookie in well, that's, what I was gonna ask you. that's what's so frustrating that that's exactly what i was going to say so he he comes up i believe it was july 2nd 2015 in yep. kc okay and i remember i had conversations on the old saturday morning sports talk show with patrick about this and we both said and talked about and marveled at the t at the time that this that this kid who had all of this power had an approach at the plate like he took good at bats this Wait is what i but this, but you know what if he had come up from day 1 and sort of been this guy sammy softball right i'd be like okay that's sort of him it it might be disappointing but it's him but you just hit on it and it's the one thing i will never among the things in sports that confuse me the most how do you come up in 2015 and I'm not saying that teams didn't adjust. They clearly did to him. But his approach was damn solid, like really impressively good. Mm -hmm. um, an approach that at the time Byron Buxton could have only dreamed of having. How do you end up here from there? I, I don't quite know. Like, I don't know how he's regressed this much. Like, yes, the league's adjusted to him. But, um, I mean, you, we could all go back and look at our tweets from 2015. Like, I was just marveling at how many close pitches he took you know he had a he had a good on base percentage he was still striking out a lot but like he he looked like again like a 10-year vet you know and like i don't know if it's a mental thing i don't know i mean he's obviously had a lot of you know things go against him so, some self-inflicted maybe you know in, in his years in the big leagues but uh you know he has financial security now you know he sat they signed him to the extension which i thought I wasn't sure. Um, to, to me, he seems like a guy you go year to year on in arbitration, but um, <laughs> but they signed him to the extensions, you know. So he, I, I just, it's clear now to me that he's. I don't think he's ever going to go back to that because he's in his prime, you know. Um, yep. and, and this is when he should be just absolutely crushing the ball and and taking great at bats, and we just haven't seen it in over a full season since 2015. We saw it in the first half of 2017 when he made the All Star game, and then he got hurt. Um, so I think. I think he's going to be an oft injured, uh, huge home run, huge strikeout guy. Um, that's just what he is, unfortunately, and it's just too bad. It's just too bad because he, he he could have been a really really great player. But you know, he's still valuable. He's still worth plugging in at first base. Absolutely, um, he'll be a DH at some point. And um, but yeah, it's I don't know. I I I wish I had a better answer on Sano, but I think it probably mystifies the Twins as, as much as it mystifies us. Remarkable. All right, sir. Thank you, Jake DePew. We'll talk to you next week for more uh, Talking Twins, okay? All right. It was fun. Thank you.